Hello and welcome to this video by CyberSquad Gaming. Today we're going to be looking at Star Wars Squadrons. This is going to be an informational video and we're going to be looking at some of the gameplay aspects and some of the information we've been able to collect on what we expect from the game so far. The game is scheduled to be released on October 2nd, 2020 for Xbox, PC and PS4. Even though this is not a next-gen title, due to backwards compatibility I expect the next-gen consoles to be able to play this game. So this is going to be a $40 game, which is great, it's not full price, but it's going to have cross-play enabled, which I think is fantastic. I think as the industry moves forward in gaming, the idea of fair cross-play has become the standard, and I just love the fact that EA is embracing that. So the developers come out and said they're going to support PSVR and PC VR, so that's great news. And on top of that, they're also going to support flight sticks, but more details on specifically supported sticks is going to come much closer to launch. You can see in the video above how he rotates his head to look around. That's going to be so immersive when you're in a dogfight, flying between debris, just trying to get that extra little look about where the enemies are and if they're in behind you, etc. It's going to be a lot of fun. I personally believe that VR in racing games and flight games is like the perfect use of VR because you're in a seated position so your head can just move as you use your normal controls. So the developers also come out and confirm this game will be first person only, which the ship HUD being used as the pilot's only ship information adding to the immersion. I can't help but think back to the good old days of PC flight sims like F-16, Fighting Falcon and the like. The idea of putting you in the cockpit changes your level for spatial awareness and this means the skill level for great pilots can be even higher. Combine this with what appears to be the ability to slide and quickly maneuver around ships and debris, we're going to find who are the real ace pilots when this game launches. There's also going to be a full single player experience, and I can't wait to try that as well as a multiplayer which we'll discuss further on in the video. EA is stuck with letting you play as the Imperial side of the conflict, and I think that's a great decision to allow you to play both factions. I thought the decision in Star Wars Battlefront 2 to play as the Imperial side was an interesting perspective, and I hope there's some very deep storytelling and character development before they really throw you into the rest of the multiplayer. The story is going to take place after the end of the original trilogy, just after the second Death Star was destroyed and the Battle of Endor is over. I like that the game is stepping out from the movie timeline, because I think it gives the developer greater freedom to explore new stories and new avenues within the Star Wars franchise. So far, six locations have been confirmed for the game, and I'm going to throw them up on the screen so that you can go ahead and look at the environments for each of these. Yavin Prime, located in the Outer Rim Territories, is a massive gas giant. Yavin 4 was home to a rebel base and remains a significant location for the New Republic. Esiles close to the New Republic space. Esiles has been under Imperial control for a decade. Inside this ice ring, the Empire conceals a listening post. The New Republic wishes to destroy it. Nadari Dockyards, a spaceship manufacturing city hidden deep inside the Bormir sector. The New Republic defends this at all costs. And Sisabu is a seventh planet of the Candrilla system in the Boromir sector, surrounded by the remains of salvaged Imperial ships. The debris field is a threat to any capital ship that risks flying inside it. Galanta is a remote moon in a dangerous but beautiful Ringula nebula. The forces of the nebula have pulled the moon apart into an asteroid field, still full of molten fragments. And then we have the Zavin Abyss, has this area of space in the expansion region. It's filled with asteroids with electrical energy from the maelstrom and the shipwrecks of those that have dared to enter it in the past. The game is also going to consist of four usable craft types for each faction. So for the Imperial side of things, we've got the TIE Fighter, which is the Fighter Class, the TIE Bomber, the Bomber Class, the TIE Interceptor, the Interceptor Class, and the TIE Reaper, which is the Support Class. Then for the Republic side, we have the X-Wing, which is the Fighter Class. Fighter Classes are all very supposed to be balanced. The Y-Wing, our Bomber Class, this is the heavy hitting runs when we want to really destroy the enemy's main capital vessels. The A-Wing, an Inceptor used to take on other fighters with high speed and maneuverability. And then the U-Wing, a support vessel with life-saving repairs and supplies. This class system follows the normal versions that we see in a lot of games, Assault, Heavy, Support, and DPS. But I don't remember it being applied to a flight game of this type before. Normally class-based combat requires tight coordination and short distance to your team. This class system is going to be interesting, and the key will be that the meta doesn't become Fighter, Interceptor, and those are heavily favored by those individual rogue players. The fact that you meet in a pre-game to decide roles and strategy makes me believe this won't be the case if you can get an organized team together. The game appears to have a very robust customization system, both in cosmetic and abilities. 
We're not going to have microtransactions, everything can be earned in game, and that's fabulous news. This is what the players have wanted after years of loot boxes, and this is only positive. I personally can't wait to get my Ewok bubble head and my chrome plated X-Wing. The idea of 50 components that let you build the ultimate ship means you can really design them to your playstyle. They appear to be in a couple of groups, lasers, rockets and torpedoes, defensive shields and propulsion. I do wonder how quick you can change the loadout, or whether we'll get to build loadouts that we can quickly change from game to game or even life to life as we play through the maps. The first multiplayer mode that we get shown in this trailer is dogfights, and this reminds me of the Star Wars Battlefront game mode that allowed 20 players in aerial combat. Squadrons is a tighter experience with only 5 people with more defined roles in each squadron, but I'm guessing this could possibly be where the original idea for this kind of game came from. The second mode, Fleet Battles, is a multi-stage conflict that reminds me of the Starfighter Assault from Battlefront 2 or Operations Field from Battlefield. Teams attack in stages that if they win, they get to move closer to the enemy's capital ship. Losing a stage, you get pushed back. This first fight is a dogfight in the middle, followed by an attack on medium-sized capital ships after you win that, before pushing on to destroy major components of large capital vessels. This is the mode I'm most excited about to play with my friends. We all love this objective-based game modes in all of the games we play. I am personally excited to play this game. I can't wait to get in there in VR and play with my buddies and really just immerse ourselves in it. Well, I hope you found this information all very useful. Thanks for watching this video. Remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date on the latest from Cyber Squad Gaming.